is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. China's top diplomat, Wang Yi, tells U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken his visit to Beijing comes at a critical time in the two countries' relations. Blinken is set to meet President Xi this hour. Goldman Sachs becomes the latest bank to cut its forecast for China's economy, slashing its GDP growth projection for this year from 6% to 5.4%, and Boeing forecasts an $8 trillion decade for the aviation sector despite economic headwinds. We'll hear from the plane maker's chief executive this hour, live at the Paris Air Show. So first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. Remember, it is Juneteenth in the U.S., so a lot of the markets are closed, including treasuries. If you look at global stocks, they do seem to be slipping after the Wall Street rally we saw on Friday that fizzled. Chemicals, construction firms are pacing some of the declines in Europe. Telecom stocks outperformed amongst the individual movers. We have Sertorius slumping 15 percent after issuing a bigger than expected profit warning. Let's also look at some of the other things we're watching out for. Euro dollar 109. 32. And then if you need to look at what exactly we know from the Fed, look, last week they kept interest rates unchanged, warning of more tightening ahead in the past, pausing rate hikes for three months after such a run of interest rate hikes has boosted talk prices. So let's also have a look at the European map. I think we have that. Otherwise, we get straight on to breaking news. And the ECB has um, said to tell banks to brace for harsher stress test results. Now, this is something that we had, of course, tried to figure out whether they wanted to make sure that every possibility was accounted for. European regulators telling banks that they have been sailing through um, some of, of course, the Fed stress or the stress test from Europe, and that was not working. So, on to politics and U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will meet China's President Xi. Shortly, China's top foreign policy official, Wang Yi, has told Blinken to revoke the, quote, illegal sanctions on China and end its suppression of the nation's technology development. Now, the two foreign policy leaders have been meeting in Beijing. And meanwhile, the U.S. State Department said it was, quote, a candid and productive discussion. So for more on all of this, let's get straight to Bruce Einhorn in Hong Kong. Bruce, good morning. What do we know more about what Blinken has accomplished so far in the visit? Well, Francine, I think the fact that there is going to be a meeting between the Secretary of State and the Chinese president is a sign that from the Chinese side, they think that the talks are going well. Uh, Secretary of State Blinken had a meeting of more than three hours with the top party foreign affairs official Wang Yi today. That followed a meeting yesterday that went for more than seven hours with the foreign minister. Uh, this meeting with President Xi Jinping was not on the schedule, and it was a big question of whether or not it was going to happen. President Xi did meet last week with Bill Gates when Bill Gates was visiting China. Um, and if uh, uh, Antony Blinken did not have this meeting with Xi Jinping, then it could have been a sign that the talks didn't go well. On the other hand, now we know that there is going to be this meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I think people are looking for signs that U.S. and China relations are on the mend should uh, be optimistic as a result of this. All right, we'll get you, well, we'll, we'll let you get a sip of water to try and understand exactly what uh, Blinken and President Xi will talk at 4.30 p.m. local time, so it's about 25 minutes. I don't know whether we're expecting, um, Bruce, then some kind of readout on what the two discussed. Meanwhile, China's premier is on a trip to Europe, so what's on his schedule? Uh, well, to answer your question about the rate, we do know that there is scheduled a press conference uh, that Antony Blinken will have uh, later in early in the evening uh, Beijing time. So we do expect that we will hear something about the meeting with President Xi as well as the overall uh, sense from the U.S. side of how all these meetings have gone. Uh, so that should be happening in a few hours. To answer your other question, the Chinese premier is on his first visit overseas since uh, taking on this job. He's meeting with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz today. He's going to be then traveling to France, and he'll be meeting with President Macron. Uh, the Chinese have been trying for a while now to try to create a little bit of distance between the Europeans and the Americans when it comes to things like technology sanctions 
at, Char at China. The Chinese also are going to struggle a bit because they have to try to repair relations that have really been frayed following the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by the Russians because the Chinese have, of course, tilted toward Moscow uh, in that war. And so that's something that is going to weigh heavily on uh, Sino-European relations. All right, Bruce, thank you so much. Bruce Einhorn there in Hong Kong. Now, we understand that Germany and Intel have also agreed subsidies for a chip plant worth 10 billion euros. Now, this was part of the Germany industrial plan, of course, to try and get more capacity of some of the crucial things needed also to roll out artificial intelligence. Now, Chinese stocks pairing losses following that meeting between Blinken and Xi. Earlier stocks were down after the state council fell short of announcing more policy measures to support the Chinese economy. So joining us now is Maximilian Kunkel, Chief Investment Officer for Germany at UBS Global Wealth Management. Maximilian, thank you for joining us. When you look at some of the pitfalls, there does seem to be one thing that market can't get their head around, which is the Fed hiking for longer. What's going on? It seems there's a still some dissonance between, on the one hand, the bond market that is already looking for a new cutting cycle early next year, the equity market that is interpreting those potential cuts as a positive for risk, and of course, on the other hand, what you just mentioned, the Federal Reserve saying, look, guys, there's just not going to be any cuts that quickly. And the risk here is clearly that that gap is going to close at the expense of equities. Because you're only really going to see that cutting cycle come through quickly in case of a risk-off event, be it with regards to financial markets or be it with regards to the economy. And if you don't get that cutting cycle, then of course that is going to pressure multiples. And that would be in particular be an issue for uh, US equities, given multiples are already quite elevated. So Maximilian, what does it mean for actually how you want to build your portfolio? So how much risk appetite do you want in there? I think top down, everybody's now talking about this new bull market, but it doesn't really feel like a new shiny bull market. So top down, we'd still prefer bonds to equities and more specifically high quality bonds towards uh, against U.S. equities. But for, you know, for everybody who's looking at the current equity market rally and looking for opportunities there, we think um, one should rather look at some of the areas that have lagged of late as likely market participants are going to rotate out of momentum into contrarian, out of DM into emerging markets. Um, and therefore, some of the things that we're looking at are, for example, um, high quality defensives, consumer staples, utilities, but also, for example, industrials rather than just technology. And at the same time, we early on talked about, uh, about emerging markets in China more broadly. We're also tactically seeing an opportunity in emerging markets versus developed markets. So, Maximilian, what does that say when you look at some of the bond yields? I don't know whether there's any opportunity to buy something in Europe or whether there's a, the, the similar dynamic as you see with the U.S. and the Fed. So we think that big picture, we have the peak in inflation that's in and central banks are coming to the end of this hiking cycle. And when we're just looking at the past seven cycles, what we've had in the United States, but, you know, similar things could be said about other regions um, over the next two years post the last fed hike bonds quite meaningfully outperformed cash so we think this is a good time to lock in some of those higher yields through high quality fixed income maybe not go too long duration so we'd rather have a barbell approach short duration and then some medium duration focus but we do think it makes a lot of sense to lock in some of those yields with a focus on high quality names Maximilian, when you look at opportunities, when you look at certain, some of the industries that could benefit from a China reopening, are you bullish or bearish on China? So tactically, look, the story could actually be, if it wasn't for geopolitics, be a quite simple one. You have a weaker currency, you have lower inflation, you have lower bond yields. So you have a loosening in financial conditions. And when you have that, things can go very quickly if concerns around geopolitics ease, if concerns around the state of the economy and support from the government eases. And we might get that. So short term, we are tactically positive on Chinese equities outright. But at the same time, also, of course, of some of the winners that could benefit from all of this and that have recently lagged a little bit. So think, for example, materials in, in Europe, but at the same time, certain industrial plays that, in our view, should, should benefit from um, this 
potentially positive momentum uh, in China, as many people seem to be throwing in the towel. Uh, Maximilian, any, any opportunities actually in the UK right now? Look, we always have to remember the FTSE 100 is not the UK economy. Um, and in fact, actually, when you're looking at the FTSE 100, it is already trading very cheap, close to record discount versus global markets, highest dividend yield of any major region out there and pretty well covered. And it's also got a fairly defensive tilt. So if one was to think that we could be seeing choppier markets ahead, this slow beta market could actually do fairly well. And, you know, one of the things that we could also be seeing very near term is a potentially somewhat weaker pound if concerns around the economy start to reignite. That would again be beneficiary, of course, to the FTSE 100, given more than 70 percent of revenues come from abroad. So I think the important thing, first of all, is to think that, you know, this is not an area that we would go underweight on. Um, and uh, it's probably one where you'd rather, in the UK, prefer large caps to small caps, given concerns around the economic developments in the very near term. But the broader picture is one where this is not an underweight. Maximilian, is there something over there that, that, or over in the markets that actually looks priced to perfection to a point where you don't want to be involved because it's an, an actual bubble? Well, obviously, we have to be talking about AI here. And it's clear in the very short term, this is simply speculative to bet on a particular move of the main beneficiaries of AI. Uh, longer term, we think this technology is transformative. But I think in the very near term, especially if one was going to have concerns around momentum continuing at a time when there are concerns around Fed being higher for longer, et cetera, et cetera, I think you want to be looking at other areas. I wouldn't say it's a bubble yet, though. I, I don't think it's a bubble yet. Um, but clearly, risk reward at this point would rather point towards other areas, as we said, be it emerging markets or be it areas such as consumer staples or industrials or even utilities. Maximilian, thank you so much. Maximilian Kunko there from UBS Global Wealth Management. Now we're live at the Paris show next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the world's largest air show is back for the first time since before COVID. Much like previous years, while well, the battle for the skies between Airbus and Boeing will be center stage. And our very own Guy Johnson joins us now from the Paris Air Show. Guy. Francine, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, welcome back to the Paris Air Show as ever. The battle between Boeing and Airbus, as you say, Francine, front and centre. But it was interesting coming into the show, we've seen a whole raft of orders. Uh, Boeing getting orders from a whole range of airlines, including Ryanair, a huge order coming through from Michael O'Leary. Um, so maybe the battles started a few weeks back, a few days back, certainly. Um, so let's talk about where we are. There's a lot of things going on. Stan Deal is the right person to ask those questions to. Uh, he is the CEO of Boeing Commercial Aeroplanes. Uh, he is the lead figure for Boeing here at the show. This is, this is your hunting ground. It is, it is going to be a busy show. How busy is it going to be? I just got back from IATA. The airlines there, I have never seen more excited airline CEOs. Uh, totally agree with you, Guy. Uh, it's probably the busiest I've seen the industry uh, post a uh, exogenous shock like COVID. And uh, I think you're going to see orders, uh, but you also see the robustness around the discussion in the supply chain. There's a lot of, a lot of people here trying to convince Boeing that they have a better idea in terms of how to source and, and prepare parts. So that's going to be part of the discussion. And then investors are looking here as well. Yep. Um, is there a danger airlines are over-ordering? As you say, there seems to be a kind of a bit of exuberance around at the moment. Well, it's definitely a supply-constrained uh, market. From our perspective, we're trying to bring rates up responsibly. Uh, that puts a little pressure on the airlines to get into the order books. No, I don't think so. I think as you look at our order books, they're extending from now all the way out into the 2030s. Yep. So it's a nice level ordering uh, through that stream. The economic indicators we look at, yep. and we published our market so, yeah. outlook report, 42,600 airplanes over the next 20 years would say, no, they're not over ordered. How, you've got, a, you've got a huge order book. 
and narrow bodies are, are, are pretty much sold out. You're looking at a situation where wide bodies are going in the same direction. How do you price this far in advance when inflation is as volatile as it is right now? Sure. Well, first you work productivity to try to offset your costs as much as you can on escalation. Yeah. You know, it's a competitive market. We have to uh, we have to convince our customers the value of our airplane first and foremost. We think that's what the product lineup of Boeing brings. Fuel burn in double digit uh, terms in terms of benefit. Yep. Uh, our, but our competition's uh, fierce out there. So we do our best to convince our customers great value with Boeing, the price should follow, and then the competition's on. Why is this industry struggling so much with supply chain? Why is this industry struggling so much with labor? Other industries, they've got it licked, they fixed the problems. Why is aerospace? still yeah. dealing with this. M much longer cycle industry than, yep. than others. Uh, you know, you think of our, our supply chain going all the way back to raw yep. material, uh, which is four to five years out in the, the depth of the supply chain. So labor being the biggest contributing factor, we yep. went through COVID, uh, a lot of labor moved out of this industry, we're bringing it back and then we're focused on the training and the skilling is, of that is labor the lesson, coming in. Is the lesson learned, don't lay, don't lay people off during a downturn? Well, the hindsight there would yeah, say sure. yes. Hindsight capital is great. I, but absolutely, you'd say that. Uh, you know, but each exogenous shock is unique. Uh, it's tempered me on yeah. how I approach labor on the forward-looking view. I think we're going to be a little more conservative on that. But each crisis, you got to stare into and decide how do you manage this company moving forward. As you say, the supply chain's coming back. I understand you're talking about the fact you're going to take the 737 line up to 38. When, when is that going to happen? Look, soon. I'm not going to give you an exact on. date, but it's, this year. Uh, it's, oh, absolutely within the year. And uh, we're very near that moment. Uh, and we, what's the next uh, we're running that? at 31. We're about to go to 38. And then we'll look at a, a break in the 42 before the end of the year. Before the end of the year, you think you'll be at 42? Yes. Okay, uh, let's talk about what else is going on. You've got a 767 program that is going to struggle with ICO regulations, the emission regulations that's coming up. You've applied for an exemption on that. Does that mean I'm not going to get, I'm not going to see a 787 freighter anytime soon? Uh, look, I think the 767 today on the environmental front does a great job in terms of per ton uh, delivering the right emission answer. In the future, we'll look at other variants. The 787's the next natural act because it's got the right size, it's got the right uh, If you don't get the ICO exemption, do you, do you go straight for it? Well, look, we're looking at it, uh, but right now we're very focused on the 67 as the next solution. Let's talk a little bit about kind of what comes next. Um, this is an industry that is going to be supply constrained for a while by the looks of things. Is that something that you are going to use to your advantage? It, it was really interesting. The car industry during the downturn learned that it could make fewer cars and make more money. Does that apply to the aerospace industry as well? Well, I, I think what we uh, look at is you know what the long-term demand needs to be, and then we have to factor in what can the supply chain do? Yep. Uh, we've always tried to be conservative in terms of net output, uh, not to overproduce to the market. We know that is bad for pricing. Yep. Uh, and we're gonna be responsible on responding demand. And it's gotta be done within the capabilities of the supply chain. So I think it's a, it's a it, the long and short, we want to try to run right at demand or slightly under as yep. a Boeing company. Uh, never overproduce, keep the financial viability of the assets there for our, uh, the airline and those who invest in these assets. Am I going to see a big order today? Am I going to see a big order tomorrow? Am I going to see a big order this I think week? you'll see orders at the air show, guys. Boeing orders? Boeing orders. Big uh, Boeing orders? We're going to see some nice orders. Just remember, this is a four-day show. Yep. We have 364 days in a year. Yeah. It's only four days, so every we, day is we, an order day for we, us. We like it when they all come together. Stan Deal, it's fantastic to see you as ever. Thank you very much, Steve, for Thank dropping you, by guys. to see us here at Bloomberg. Francine, from the Paris Air Show, back to you. Yeah, pretty optimistic Boeing executive vice pre president there with our very own Guy Johnson. We'll have plenty more from the air show. We'll also have a full roundup of the markets. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, turning to banks and UBS chief executive Sergio Armati has hinted at massive cuts to Credit Suisse's investment banking division. Writing in a Swiss newspaper, he says UBS went through similar steps early on during his previous tenure at the bank. Now, SVB Financial Group has also agreed to sell its investment banking business, SVB Securities, to a management team group led by the chief executive officer of SVB Securities. And finally, Barclays has ramped up lending to hedge funds and rich investors in Asia. The move is part of a global plan to expand its markets franchise as rivals have scaled back. The other story we're watching out for is the ECB set to tell banks to brace for harsher stress test results. And then when you look at markets overall, we're seeing a little bit of pressure. A reminder, it is Juneteenth in the U.S. and so markets are closed. This is Bloomberg. China's top diplomat Wang Yi tells U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken his visit to Beijing comes at a critical time in the two countries' relations. Blinken is set to meet President Xi this hour. Goldman Sachs becomes the latest bank to cut its forecast for China's economy, slashing its GDP growth projections for this year from 6% to 5.4%. And Boeing forecasts an $8 trillion decade for the aviation sector, despite economic headwinds. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Bloomberg understands that European regulators are warning banks to brace for harsher stress test results. Sources say lenders that have benefited from higher interest rates need to prepare for adjustments in order to achieve more credible results. Well, Bloomberg's European finance reporter Nick Comfort now joins us. Nick, good morning. So tell us a little bit more about what the ECB is said to have told banks. Well, the banks really sailed through the early rounds of this stress test. Uh, they uh, they benefited from from uh, a high level of net interest income. That's the uh, the difference between what they pay on deposits and what they, they they earn on loans, which really was boosted last year by the rising rates. Also, sweet spot, very very few uh, insolvencies, so the loan book wasn't hit too hard. And then the stress test kind of assumes to start into, well too much in the view of some regulators that this kind of continues. And so the banks were doing really well on this stress test. Now. As we understand, the ECB has told banks to kind of calm their expectations there, that there will be a very strong challenge to these results uh, as part of the, the, the stress test. And that uh, just because they sail through really well does not mean that the results will be as rosy as they had hoped. So, Nick, what does this mean for bank dividends? Yeah, so these, these stress tests are key for, uh, for determining how much excess capital the banks have. Now, I mean, it's, it's going to, so in some cases, it may sort of uh, reduce that, that amount if, if they have a, a harsh stress test result. But uh, generally speaking, we're still expecting the, the banks to go through the stress test quite well. And uh, furthermore, a lot of the banks have a lot of excess capital. So even if the regulators don't really like the, uh, the, the fact that banks are paying out billions of euros in, in dividends and, and share buybacks, they still have a lot of funds and we would still expect to see uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of, of payouts in the, uh, in the months and, and the years ahead. Nick, thanks so much. Nicholas Comfort there, a Bloomberg European finance reporter in Frankfurt. Now, the IMF managing director, Christina Georgieva, spoke to Maria Tadeo after the ECB decision last week. And this is what she told us about growth and inflation. Some further tightening would be necessary to bring inflation firmly under control. And let me say why this is so important. Because if inflation continues to run high, one, that means interest rates have to stay higher for longer. Mm -hmm. When they're higher for longer, financial vulnerabilities could get exposed. Coming up, Bank of England decision and CPI data to come from the UK this week. So we discuss what to expect from the UK next. This is Bloomberg. Ibiza, Innsbruck and Cannes. 
luxury destinations for Amsterdam's well-heeled jet set. Perhaps, though, not for long. Schiphol Airport has announced plans to ban private jets from its runways by 2026, setting a huge precedent for other travel hubs and generating plenty of controversy. As many as 17,000 private jets crossed Schiphol's runways last year, and the airport argues they're noisier and generate 20 times more carbon emissions per passenger than commercial flights. The plan was announced a few months after climate activists stormed Schiphol's tarmac to block private jets and comes on top of the Dutch government's proposal to cap the total number of flights to and from the airport. Every sector needs perspective. Perspective of the residents, of the people you work for, for the airlines and for Schiphol itself. The private jet industry says the unexpected ban will hit business travel the hardest. Private aviation is, is a business tool, especially for Amsterdam, where the top three destinations are uh, London, Switzerland and uh, France. So they're not really... Uh, let's say, beach destinations and holiday destinations. For now, the fate of Amsterdam's private jets remains unclear. The question now is, could the move accelerate the development of more sustainable alternatives? Bloomberg Sky Johnson there on one of Europe's busiest airports plans to ban private jets. And don't miss all of our coverage and big interviews from the Paris Air Show. We'll be speaking to a slew of business leaders, including the Riyadh Air Chief Executive Tony Douglas, the Dassault Aviation Chief Executive Eric Trappier, and the Airbus Chief Executive Guillaume Faury. So stay with Bloomberg TV as we bring you all of these important conversations today and tomorrow. Now, the U.S. Transportation Secretary says he wants to de-risk global supply chains. Pete Buttigieg spoke exclusively to Haslinda Amin on the sidelines of a G7 meeting in Japan. And she began by asking him about the challenges posed by China's ownership of international container ports. As we seek to de-risk and diversify our supply chains and our economic relationships, we do want to make sure that uh, these capabilities are not concentrated with, uh, with any one country, uh, certainly uh, with a country that uh, may demonstrate a, a willingness to use these in, in ways that are not connected to what is uh, the, the best going forward, either commercially or uh, in terms of uh, the, that rules-based international order. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, at least when we can and agree on matters from climate change to public health, that, uh, that we're operating on a basis that, uh, that can be understood to be for the benefit mm -hmm. of all. Those are the kinds of things we're focused on here at the G7. You talk about de-risking. Yeah. Are there any other sectors that need de-risking? Some point to perhaps even the drug sector in China. I mean, the world is reliant uh, on basic drugs mm -hmm. when it comes to you know, China. Well, I want to make sure not to wander too far outside of my own portfolio. I know that these are uh, subjects of active conversation, both bilaterally and multilaterally. What I can say with regard to supply chains is that uh, we have seen how if there is not enough diversification, uh, you see extraordinary levels of geopolitical risk or even just logistical risk, you know, in the U.S. Uh, because of the... Uh, uh, extreme variation between the closures and the reopenings uh, in Asia and in China specifically. Uh, there's a great deal of unevenness in, in terms of the arrival of goods that our, purports were, our ports were not ready to take in mm. all at once. I think that's one uh, example of the kind of wake-up calls that the U.S. and that the global community in general have been experiencing, especially in the last two to three years. Since we're talking about supply chains, of course, semiconductors front and center. Mm. We've had the chip four, U.S., Japan, Korea, Taiwan, investing heavily in their own respective semiconductor sectors. Could that lead to overcapacity? What's your assessment? How are you looking at it? Well, uh, you know, right now, overcapacity seems to be the, the least of our problems when it comes to the race for semiconductors, and, and we saw how problematic it was when we came up short. Uh, of course, uh, this is uh, a process where the, the very intentional, direct, and ambitious use of public policy has to match the uh, unique ability of markets to allocate resources and to help make sure that the capacity is tracking uh, the, the future of demand. But what we know is that semiconductors are going to be even more important 
in the future. Uh, we think about uh, the automotive sector, for example, and the fact that a car is increasingly a, 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 as much a computer as it is a vehicle. And the same could be said of so many other sectors. Uh, so uh, rather than allow ourselves to again be in a situation where we're uh, coming up short, we're making sure that uh, both in terms of our relationships with friends and trading partners and in terms of our domestic capacity, which by the way has also benefited from uh, mm -hmm. foreign direct, direct investment that, that's really helping to create jobs on U.S. soil while strengthening our uh, partnerships and, and relationships across the Pacific. That is something that makes sense for the future and can help us to, uh, uh, to cushion some of the geopolitical risk. Boeing looking to resume its deliveries of the MAX jets to, to China. Is there a sense when that might be happening? How are you trying to push this along with the Chinese government? Uh, well, our focus from uh, from the FAA's standpoint uh, and the U.S. Department of Transportation is uh, simply on the certification and safety. Uh, the rest is uh, is a, a market matter, uh, one that uh, obviously there's a lot of interest from a trade perspective. But we're very cautious in in our administration, certainly in my department, to separate trade questions from safety questions, and the safety questions are our top focus. You talked about EVs, the mm -hmm. big boys, the likes of GM, Ford. They've come forward to say that, you know what, they're ready to adopt Tesla's um, mm -hmm. superchargers. How, how do you look at that? Will that perhaps, um, you know, make it even more difficult for your department to have oversight of a Tesla's autopilot? Uh, we view the, the relationship that's been established in terms of chargers as a positive development. Uh, our biggest concern is simply to make sure that a good, strong charging network is available. In other words, as a U.S. government, we're not out to pick winners and losers and say that this company uh, or this company's standard is, is better than the others. We did establish a, a baseline in terms of access to a certain connector to make sure that everybody uh, knew what to expect, but that was designed to be a floor and not a ceiling. Well, that was the UK Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg speaking exclusively to our Hazlund Amin. Now, a big week for UK watchers. Inflation data on Wednesday, a Bank of England rate decision on Thursday. Now, the two events will have important consequences, of course, for many mortgage holders. Bloomberg's John Stepick joins us now with the very latest. First of all, John, congratulations. I love reading your stuff. It's often controversial. What's your most controversial call for the UK? <laughs> can't There's it many. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, it started off being there wasn't going to be a recession at this time last year, and everyone was saying there would be a recession. Yeah, and then you were right. And I was right. The, the scary thing, the slightly worrying thing now, is that if rates do keep going up, then, you know, maybe there will eventually be a recession. Um, but if I'm honest, I think that at the moment markets are a bit pricing in too many interest rate hikes. Okay. Um, I think that's probably yeah. the most uh, controversial view uh, at the moment. Which is funny because it's, it's, you think it's the other way around for the Fed, right? So is, is there like a bias of negativity towards the UK that, or on inflation because everybody thinks it's so much worse? Well, yeah, partly. Um, I mean, the Fed has been able to do a, what is it they call it, kind of like, you know, a hawkish pause yeah. where they've said, <laughs> OK, we're going to skip this one, but we are still going to do two more hikes before the end of the year. Um, whereas in the UK now, we're pricing in, you know, another four hikes, four quarter point hikes by the end of the year, and a kind of 50-50 chance of going up to 6%. That seems excessive, and I think that's mostly driven by a sense that, as you say, inflation has kind of, you know, taken off in the UK. And the thing is, I think that the Bank of England almost, I mean, this particular inflation reading this week could be sticky because it's not going to, the inflation rate won't yep. drop by much. Mm. But that's partly because of the way that we've done the energy price cap in the UK. So the next significant drop in the percentage rate of inflation will probably come in the July reading because that's when the energy price cap changes again. We won't get that inflation reading until August. Right. So the Bank of England, if it is clever and it couches its language in the right way, could get away with what I've called a dovish hike yeah. this week where they put rates up by a quarter point, but they sort of start to talk the market down a tiny bit and maybe say, well, look, you know, if we put but rates... So, so you go. John, is this kind of like an inflection point? And then, I mean, they have to get it right this time for basically... And, and that has huge repercussions for bonds and traders. Yeah, and it is massive. I mean, I think there's a lot of bond traders think that uh, the market's priced in too many hikes as well. Uh, my colleague, Philip Aldrich, was writing about this this morning. Mm -hmm. Um, and basically, you know, there's a lot of bond buyers of gilts just now because they think, well, this is a good opportunity to lock in high yields because the market is over-exaggerating the number of rate hikes that are going to come. 
No. But if the Wednesday inflation date is particularly bad, and it has surprised to the upside a lot. A I lot. Mean, it's been a long I, time since yeah. we had a surprise to the downside or even yeah. expectations. Um, so that it's going to make it difficult for the bank. And, uh, and what's difficult here in the UK is, of course, mortgages, right? And, and the fact that the economy and so many people re rely on mortgages that roll over about a third every year. Like, yeah. how ugly could that be for consumers? I mean, the problem is, so, I mean, the Resolution Foundation, which is a think tank, said roughly £3,000 or £3,600 yeah. extra a year for the average mortgage by the end of 2024. Now, obviously, that's a lot of money. There are ways to address that. You know, I mean, banks can extend the period. If you're, if you're fixing your mortgage again, then obviously if you're refinancing, it means that you've got some time left on your loan, so you could extend it for a few years. It means you pay more interest, mm -hmm. but it also means that your monthly rate won't go up by as much. So there's ways for individual consumers to survive that. But there's no doubt that it knocks purchasing power out of the broader economy. And the risk, obviously, then is that if you've got you know, 1.3 million people yeah. trying to find an extra three and a half grand a year, it's got to come from somewhere. Yeah. And that then you know, lowers demand in the rest of the economy and you've got the risk of a kind of downward spiral. Right, so we talk about a credit crunch, but actually is, it quite, is spending quite precarious here in the UK or do we still have pent up savings from COVID? Well, I think those are starting to come to the end of their tether. Um, people still seem to be happy enough to spend. I mean, I think that the major issue is probably jobs. Because, I mean, the other th good thing, people complain about wages going up. Um, or, sorry, policymakers complain about wages going up. But if wages keep rising at the rate that they're rising at the moment and inflation does come down, yep. you're going to get a point this year where real wages are actually rising. And to be fair, that can take this thing out of rising mortgage rates as well. You know, you get um, inflation wages is at 7% now. Mm. So, you know, th th there's more cushion there, perhaps, than people think. But the Bank of England, if it can find the excuse to do so. I would suspect we'd want to hold off raising rates again yep. after this week until at least they see what happens in September. John, thank you so much. John Stepick there with all of the insight. He also has a great newsletter. Check out everything and a podcast at our John Stepick. We're also getting some breaking news out of Xi and Blinken. Now, we heard from President Xi. Of course, this is a huge deal. By the way, uh, Blinken, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, is the first U.S. official in five years to go up or to, to go to China. And we know that he has, of course, met with President Xi. Um, this is according to, to CGTN saying that Xi has told Blinken that China has made its position very clear. Um, Mr. Xi, President Xi has also told Blinken that his visit could help stabilize U.S.-China ties, so that could help with positive contributions. We'll also see whether we're briefed and updated on the U.S. side. Uh, for the moment, this is all, of course, on the Chinese side through CGTN. And we'll have plenty more on that throughout the day as we have more news coming out and also a warning about the rising threat of a global credit crunch. So we'll have more details on that next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the pension upheaval in the UK last year and more recent US regional bank stress may be just the beginning of rolling crises that end up in a global credit crunch. At least that's the warning from Janice Henderson Group. It says the two episodes in a world of elevated interest rates may lead to constrained credit, increasing defaults, and squeezed corporate profits. Now, let's bring in our markets today. Managing editor Christina Kino. Christine, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, look, uh, credit is often the canary in the coal mine, especially before a recession. What do, do the figures now tell us? Well, Francine, several canaries are starting to sing in the coal mine, it seems like. I mean, I think really the danger zones within the credit space are really um, a lot of debt tied to commercial real estate. That's been a sector that's really been struggling. And I think this is related to, of course, higher rates, taking their toll on company mortgages. We've seen a number of companies defaulting in some of their mortgages already on, on some of um, buildings that are used for commercial purposes. Um, and, and that's only the beginning of that, right? 
right? And then, of course, the other um, side of this as well, that's kind of the danger zone, is what's happening in a junk bond market. Mm -hmm. We're seeing company costs when it comes to issuing debt really rising in earnest. We've seen more than $11 billion of uh, investment-grade bonds downgraded to junk status just in the first quarter of 2023 alone. So several warning signs already flashing right here. Yeah, how, should, how much should we worry about bankruptcies overall? Well, Francine, I mean, definitely on the radar because that's usually kind of the next uh, phase when it comes yeah. to a credit crunch, right? Companies not having access to credit, not being able to borrow money to keep their businesses going. And then that's when we start seeing the rise of bankruptcies. Uh, I think some, by one measure, you know, we've seen more bankruptcies now than at any other time since 2009. And so if we do see a wave of company closures, especially big companies, mm -hmm. then that is potentially how the credit crunch turns into a job crunch, right? Because that's when you see kind of mass layoffs in, 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 in different industries. And so if this becomes a widespread thing, this is how kind of what's happening in the credit space spills over into the broader economy. So how has that influenced also what the Fed did with us, that hawkish pause? Well, Francine, I mean, we have seen the Fed kind of acknowledge what we've seen, for instance, in March during the banking turmoil. That was something that they definitely acknowledged as a worry, even though they did keep raising rates for a while and didn't really pause until this month. Uh, but I think, you know, if we see more episodes of really acute stress events, and, and I think also the key here would be speed. Um, if we have something that's a credit event that, that really escalates very, very quickly and, and becomes more widespread um, in just a short space of time, that's something that would really, I think, get the Fed to reconsider, okay, is this pause really going to turn into let's just end the rate hiking cycle now and perhaps even consider rate cuts? But we're not there yet, but you know, uh, you never know. But we could be. Uh, UK mortgage rates actually hitting 6% for the first time this year. I mean, this means fresh pain, and it could also have an impact on, on how consumers are spending. Absolutely, Francine. I mean, we all know the mortgage market definitely having difficulty. The difficulties this year is one of the things that's really keeping Brits very, very worried in terms of, of their being able to afford um, uh, their mortgages, how, how much their mortgages cost, or, you know, first-time home buyers trying to get into the property ladder. And so 6% mortgages, I mean, that's something that we've really not seen no. in the last decade or so. I mean, that's really going to hurt uh, affordability benchmarks and, and anyone who's been trying to get a house. Uh, I think that just became a lot more difficult for them now. Thank you so much, our Christina Kino. There was the very latest, of course, on some of these markets. We're also getting some breaking news out of Xi and Blinken. They're still meeting, as far as we understand, according to uh, some of the Chinese media, including CGTN. Uh, President Xi has told uh, Blinken that China has made its position very clear and that the visit, though, could help stabilize some of these ties. So we'll have plenty more uh, from that throughout the day. This is what else we have coming up uh, today and the rest of the week. We have the Bank of England a little bit later on this week. That's on Thursday. Ahead of that on Wednesday, we have some CPI inflation forecast. And then we look at the markets overall as there was quite a lot uh, expected in terms of stimulus for China. That hasn't come yet. And so we're seeing a bit of pressure across the board for some of these stocks today. A reminder also, it is Juneteenth in the U.S., so markets are closed. Bloomberg continues with Yusuf Gamal Din in Dubai. This is Bloomberg.